received one of the highest ranked um, results that uh, John McAfee's audit team reported, which is publicly available online. But from an investment perspective, these are some of the advances. I know my time is uh, is, is up, but I'll I'll, feel, I'll be happy to share this presentation with you guys and thank you in advance for your time. Mama, if you want to head on up here. Um, I will know, you know, that we are here at the Harvard Club in Midtown, and of course, I don't know how many of you went to Harvard, but, you know, people who aren't too full themselves will just say they went to school in Boston, you know? And so, with that being said, just due south of us is, of course, the club for Penn, right? So here we are, slightly uptown from Penn. Mau Mau will now talk to us about something very interesting, which is using the blockchain. So, um, so I mean, we have a lot of details in here. You can just read this on your own. I want to take uh, <laughs> I, I want to take the limited amount of time I have to um, to talk about why we're doing this. So, you know, my co-founder Dixon, he's the one that should be here right now. He's in Nigeria. This is his third financial inclusion startup. Why is he doing this over and over again? Why is he trying to get this right? Because this is his ethos. This is what he's setting out to do, to bring economic development to his country, to his, to his whole region. So why isn't he here? Because I have a US passport, and he doesn't. So, so what am I talking about here? What I'm talking about is that there's a huge difference in opportunity that is distributed around the world. Even though, I mean, as human beings, are we, is there that much difference in, in, in inherent value? Is there that much difference in potential value? in talent, and creativity, and intelligence? Probably not, but opportunity, on the other hand, is very unevenly distributed. Now, why am I doing this? So, I was, uh, I was going to college in, in New York when Occupy Wall Street happened. I went down there, I was studying graphic design. A million people got nothing, their wealth didn't increase at all. And they were like, man, that, that's, that's, that's all right. And I agreed, but they had no solution. What was their solution? Let's break up the banks. And that's, that's not really a solution, not anymore. So, you know, I was, I was wondering, man, this graphic design thing isn't really doing anything, is it? So I ended up going to finance instead. And so, so when I and Dixon met, it was a very natural, I think, it was immediate mind melt because what we're working on is ultimately the same thing. It's about better aligning distribution of wealth with creation of value. It's better aligning opportunity with people that have the potential to use it. And so that's what we're doing at Core. It's very simple. And so we have, you know, we're starting with a very, very small slice of everything that can be unlocked. So we're, what we're doing is we're signing up producers, we're signing up farmers, we're signing up weavers. We just had a chat yesterday with someone who wants to make micro loans to, to rickshaw drivers. These are the the bottom of the pyramid is people that really add value, that are the backbone to our, our global society. And how much are they being compensated? Apparently, according to Oxfam, not at all. What we're doing is we're allowing you know, exporters, brands, people that have the capital to connect directly with these producers of value to be able to establish this direct relationship and take out all these intermediaries, the, the uh, rickshaw companies, the logistics companies, the brokers, we're gonna take them all out we're going to create this enormous transparency, and by doing so, what we hope to do is unlock the enormous value that is that has been locked up inside these markets, that has been locked up by high operating costs that we can unlock with the blockchain. So that's what we're doing. We have quite a few betas coming up in 2018 that I can't talk about because it's recorded. So come talk to me afterwards, and happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Read on your own. Um, I, uh, I, I, I definitely appreciate that. Also, Mau Mau, who is like the best name for anybody in the blockchain space. Um, so let's get the panel up here. We got Alex, Jeff Bannon, Isaac, Ron, the very, anybody else? And Isaac. Yep, I got it. 
So uh, let me kind of uh, do the, the 10,000 10, foot um, view of what we're going to talk about. Um, this is a group with a great deal of experience. Jeff hasn't been up today, but he kind of was the fintech guy at the CFTC. So he has some great insight. He's like the first, you the first fintech guy at the CFTC. So, so Jeff's going to have some real insight for us on a little bit of it, how, um, how the CFTC works and how it looks at it. Um, Ron is uh, he, from in, in an old life. He, he's a new oak. He that's in his day, to say the least. Um, we already know um, Alex. Well, we know him about 1,500 people ago. He kind of launched this conference. And, of course, um, Isaac is... Uh, works for both the public company and uh, managed to allow me to make jokes about marijuana. So, with this group, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff a little bit to help frame this issue a little bit because uh, obviously uh, uh, the use. Good, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, probably more of an optimist about the uh, kind of arc of progress in terms of regulation and regulatory certainty. Uh, you know, often uh, you, you see things, whether it's uh, my former boss, the chairman of the CFTC and the chairman of the SEC, testifying in front of the Senate Banking Committee yesterday or when they published an op-ed a couple of months, sorry, a couple of weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal. No, I think we're gradually moving towards greater regulatory certainty that's actually going to uh, promote the overall kind of ecosystem and kind of really create a better world for a lot of these types of innovations. That doesn't mean everybody's going, you know, that there's going to be carte blanche. You know, it's very uh, apparent. And, you know, I think I'm going to sort of characterize a bit high level the overall approach of the CFTC and the SEC just in terms of kind of from the mission perspective but then I can drill down a bit in, in the there. So, you know, as, as a regulator, you know, you're, you, you have a number of missions that you need to balance. Um, and they're, they're very important. And, you know, what, you know, in the case of um, the SEC, when their chairman, you know, has given some of his numerous public statements uh, about, you know, his concerns about ICOs, uh, his concerns about fraudsters, uh, his concerns about, you know, the, the professionals, the lawyers and accountants who are promoting these things are not really, you know, guiding and steering people carefully. You know, that reflects their uh, commitment to the mission of investor protection, uh, you know, anti-fraud, and, and, and so on. And similarly, the CFTC, customer education, and investor protection, customer protection. You know, at the same time, you know, there's a lot of awareness of, you know, the powerful potential for innovation. Um, you know, in, in uh, you know, uh, Chairman Giancarlo was, was really, I think, one of the first federal regulators to be out there speaking about the potential benefits of distributed ledger technology. You know, two years ago in 2016, when, uh, you know, a lot of Regulators weren't re wasn't really on people's radar screen, and in fact, probably most people in this room had never heard of the CFTC. Uh, I mean, I remember when I went to work there in 2014, and I said, "Oh, I'm going to work for this agency doing, you know, important financial regulatory work that I'm very excited about." What's it called? The CFTC, or like the FTC, the CFPB. You know, a lot of people had not heard about it, although the agency does very important work and got lots of additional responsibilities after the financial crisis. But, you know, then Commissioner, now Chairman Giancarlo, spoke at, you know, a relatively early distributed ledger and blockchain technology um, conference, and he, he, he uh, you know, just as he and the Chairman of the SEC did in their Wall Street Journal editorial a couple of weeks ago, pointed to the actions and, and inactions that Congress took 
in the 1990s during the development of the, of the internet. And he uh, evoked a principle, first, do no harm. And you know that, that is something that, um, that, the, that he is speaking about to this day. And so um, yesterday, um, when he and Chairman Clayton uh, talked about the fact that you know some of these blockchain and virtual currency, that the regulatory framework around that, you know, that much of it has grown up around, you know, uh, in the context of, you know, payments and, and kind of new and potentially better ways to do payments, uh, and that those have been um, come up under state money transmitter law and money service businesses rules, and they said perhaps we should revisit whether there should be a comprehensive federal framework. That is not, in my view, them saying, you know, let's get in the way of blockchain. Let's stop virtual currencies. It's let's have a coherent framework that's consistent where innovators can have legal certainty, where you, know, you don't have all the complexity of going state by state. Now, in our system, we have a federal and a state system and state sovereignty and the state's laboratories are very important. But I, I really believe that kind of these developments need to be looked at in the context of you know, pro-innovation, but also pro-investor protection and anti-fraudsters and strong enforcement. So, you know, with, with that, I'm going to kind of turn to, to Ron. You know, the, the rest of this crowd, the rest of this panel, I should say, has raised a dollar or two in their day and had to deploy it. Um, from your perspective, Ron, what, what's, what are the opportunities? And then kind of, uh, if you could, frame a little bit around the whatever pressure you have for any of this regulatory ambiguity um, as you're looking to, to uh, both on the advisory side and, and obviously in the asset side. Sure. Um, a little bit about, uh, a little bit of quick background why I may be a good, have a good perspective here to offer. Um, in 2003, I was ahead of the game on the, what is referred to as credit default swaps for asset-backed securities. So I actually wanted to be able to access the market uh, not through a market that was very controlled by the, uh, the big brokers, but, but be able to do that, be able to get the collateral that I want the way that I wanted it, not the way it was being offered. So that uh, contract ended up being called pay as go or pay go which ultimately in 2007 or 8 was then was blamed for bringing the global financial markets down. I entered into the very first trades of that and it structured the first uh, thing. But then who does the regulators went to to actually try to if I was on the buy side, I was not on the sell side, I was not making money from innovation, I was making just a tool that allows me to do what I need in my portfolio management. Flexibility and transparency. What was not there in the asset-backed world was the transparency. That was not there, still not there, and will not be there because these instruments are very, uh, very complex. The second experience I've had, and uh, that's more recent, is in the municipal bond market. This is a bond, this is a market that's been around forever. Uh, the issue of state versus uh, federal is explained, but it is the worst market from getting really real information about the issuers. They, are, they come to the market, they issue billions. Detroit in 2006 issued a $2 billion pension, pension bond at par value. Uh, those bonds were not trading at par when they actually went down. So, what I really think is that, and, then, and I also uh, advise SEC on several matters before they actually bring it to the market, they actually make it, and, and have done so, uh, because SEC has admitted and agrees that they're just not equipped. They do not have the, 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 the depth and the, the market uh, savviness to be able to be actually be a top, be a regulator on time. So by definition, they always come after an accident that's happened. After. So that is a real problem. So the opportunity is trying to figure out a way that 
that instruments in the marketplace come with a transparency attached. And that's where blockchain would be helpful. I really do think um, I'm a strong believer of transparency. If you're going to say, what, why did I leave BlackRock and I started Mule? For a simple reason that there was no transparency and there was no motivation to create transparency in a lot of assets. You heard loans, micro loans, you know, community loans, a lot of that. About 80% of the total assets are assets that are not transparent. They're just not there. Uh, because what comes to the market is very um, structured in a way that there are a lot of agents in between, and that creates a huge amount of friction between the end user of that finance versus the one who wants to invest in it. And by shrinking that, I think we're going to benefit quite a bit. And I think ETFs themselves have done so in the equity market. Now the question is, can they go beyond that? And that's really why I'm here today on this panel. You know, Isaac um, has experience in a, a, a different, highly regulated market, obviously. Um, that demands a lot of transparency in a world that used to, I guess, only operate in shadows. So, um, when you're looking at uh, compliance, which obviously is is something that's kind of in your world, is does it does it feel like it's getting clearer, or feel like it's getting less clear for you, um, the world of of uh, of regulation with respect to the blockchain, ICOs, tokenization, et cetera. Sure. So um, we uh, we were one of the first cannabis-related companies to go public through an S-1 registration statement back in 2014. And at the time, every other cannabis company on the market had done a reverse merger, had very little disclosures about them, and quite frankly, no real business models. Um, so. You know, everyone called us crazy for wanting to go public through an S1, go through the front door and do things the right way. Um, and, you know, it, it, quite frankly, had never been done before. Um, so the people were a little, you know, uh, you know, it was, it was an interesting thing to see. And, uh, you know, we, we were able to, to go effective um, and, and start trading back uh, early 2015. But it's a similar situation now with, with all of these ICOs and these coins. Um, out there, um, they have very little disclosure attached to them. Um, you know, they're certainly not registered under the, you know, Securities Act, and they're not following these proper disclosure requirements. So, from our perspective, we are getting into the blockchain space. We are, um, you know, very excited about its potential, but we're properly disclosing it. And I think that's what um, what the regulators are most keen on, at least from from an issuer standpoint. And then the industry itself, um, the cannabis industry, did used to operate in the shadows, and it still kind of has that stigma attached to it. But if you look at the regulations that um, were passed in nearly every state with a medical or, or recreational cannabis law, they're also all based around disclosures, properly recording what cannabis you have in stock on a daily basis, exactly where it is and in what quantities. Um, so it's kind of cool being uh, that, that both of the uh, industries that were um, kind of most focused on the finance industry and the cannabis industry are all about disclosure. You know, and I have a little quick side story on that note. You know, we have clients in, in Arizona in the cannabis space, and um, I managed to uh, walk through a dispensary and pick up a product, and I was talking about it, I walked through the door to the back and had to write up a report on myself. So it turns out that, that it is highly regulated. Um, but there was, there was camera footage of me returning it right in the box. Um, you know, I, I, I guess for somebody um, like in your position, Alex, just because you were in VoIP and you were doing these things, right, that like crossed over into all this regulatory mishmash. Um, do you see this as like kind of similar to w whenever you've been involved in various sort of uh, disruptive technologies, kind of the, like I don't even know what regulator to go to problem, or is this different in some way to you? Well, I, I think uh, you know governments represent the people and the regulators represent the government. So so I, I was actually very positively uh, surprised 
uh, with both the hearings and the written, the written opinion or whatever, you know, not opinion, but whatever, the, the memo that was issued, which is, uh, uh, I think it was very smart to uh, use the exchanges at the ch at choke point uh, to really allow this industry to develop because uh, it is the job, somebody has to decide what are good projects, what are bad projects, right? And by basically forcing the exchanges uh, to be that choke point, forcing the exchanges to uh, to do the quality controls and everything else that, that is necessary to eliminate frauds and eliminate bad projects. Uh, I, I think both uh, commissioners are effectively forcing the community to do the job for itself. So it's effectively saying, hey, uh, you guys should have been self-regulating already. The CME knows how to do it, the CBOE knows how to do it. You guys don't seem to be able to get organized. So we're going to force you to do it, right? Because we're not going to hire thousands of people to go and scrub every project and decide if, if it's good or bad. So, so I think the, the, um, the path that has been put in front of us, us, I mean the crypto community, is a very positive path. And, and if you look at the global regulators, again, I just came uh, this morning, I flew in from Singapore, I was in Korea before that. And I met regulators in all these countries, and, and I've, I'm yet to meet a le regulator who hates crypto. They, they, the opposite. They think it's an amazing thing. They think it's going to help their people in every country, but they're all looking to the United States as a leader. All these people are effectively saying, we have to wait to see what the U.S. is going to do. So, um, I was on the plane when this was, uh, uh, you know, when, the, when this was done, and I didn't have good internet connection. And I, was, I got like one page, and then I got another page. And I was like getting to the meat of it, and it took me like four hours to get to the meat of it, which was, which was actually a good thing, because I was like, I was expecting the worst, and, and it, I was extremely positively surprised. So uh, now the ball is in our court, ours meaning the, the crypto community, and, and, and we either drop it uh, and allow uh, scammers and uh, bad guys and bad apples all over the world to, to take advantage of this industry, or we can take this revolution that, that, that has been given to us by the Satoshi, we still don't know who it is, but we were given this amazing thing, which is re a replacement to uh, 700 years of, of centralized uh, uh, corporate dominance, right? I mean, you asked me about VoIP, right? So I, VoIP was, was basically, you know, in Korea, I reminded that Korea was one of the first countries that launched VoIP, which in 95. And uh, it, it cost $3 a minute to call from Korea to the United States. And now it costs zero. So, and it was dominated by centralized uh, phone companies. Today, any phone, anyone could be a phone company, right? I mean, I think our previous presenter is, has a phone company servicing Korea too. So, so that is, and it's de completely decentralized. There's no central VoIP node that services the entire planet, right? I mean, there's uh, hundreds of thousands of nodes that you use every time you use Skype or WhatsApp or any of these things. So, so you know. I, I was there in the beginning of that movement, over a billion people use it every day today. So when I think about crypto, that's what I see. I see that kind of impact. And unless we uh, and allow that to come through and really uh, take humanity to the next level, uh, all we're going to see is banks squeezing some extra profits because they injected blockchain into their uh, back office. That's not what Satoshi intended. So. If we're serious about this, then we need to do it the right way. So I'm going to give everybody I'm going to give everybody about 90 seconds or so to kind of predict the future. The reason I like to do this is because I've uh, consistently been wrong every time I've done it, and because we t we tape all these conferences, you know, I get to look back at all the anyway. So. President Clinton's done a very good job. Anyway, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm counting on this panel. Ron, I'm turning to you first. Um, mostly, <laughs> mostly because you're next. <laughs> so if you can give the 90 seconds of, of what this looks like in two years. In other words, is this just kind of like Uber, where everybody just kind of goes, well, I guess that happened, and we had a bunch of regulations, and we still kind of like squabble about it, but we've accepted that as life. Or does it look like it's fully regulated? Or do we have regulators kind of overregulate to the point that it gets snuffed out? In, 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 not, not pointing right to the United States, but around the world. 
option for? Uh, well, you know, you got to look at the core proposition here. At the end of the day, uh, revolutions happen because there is demand. There is the people who want it, and it because they are not happy with the status quo. They're just not happy. So, I think you will find that there is not a single CEO of a bank today. It doesn't matter. It's J.P. Morgan. It's Merrill Lynch. It's all of these parties know that they're going to be disrupted. It's just a matter of when. So they're going to be actually maybe resisting the, 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 the time frame that this gets done, but ultimately this is already the horses out of the barn, in my view. And the reason is there are benefits to the way the information gets transformed, the way things get authenticated, and, but there are problems that need to be solved. One of them is you cannot have a currency with a lot of friction in trade. That needs to go away. Volatility should go away because you ultimately need professional market makers in this market. You cannot rely on a bunch of people who are really just doing this because they're bored. They're either playing something else or they're trading their you know, they're, they're the play market. Because I've seen that. People are just really tied to this this, this thing, or whether they made the money and they lost it and they made it again, the mood change. So my 90 seconds got a little bit longer than it is. So I believe the evolution is going to be also longer than we think. But at the end of the day, this is here to stay. I, I will uh, pass it along to you, Jim. Yeah. What's the future? Sure. Um, not legal or investment advice. <laughs> right, I've been right, but we're going to do our best. Yeah. Can I authenticate that? It's immutable. Uh, Cindy's taping it and putting it somewhere. It never, never change a word. So, so um, I, I'm very optimistic, um, not about a specific protocol or technology or coin or currency, but um, you know, I think that you know, two years from now when we kind of look back at where we, where we are. I mean, a lot of the problems that we saw will, will have been solved, you know, things that were kind of proof of concepts, things on slides that, that we saw that, you know, we're moving from, you know, kind of in 2015 and 2016, blockchain was more of a concept, and then we started to see proof of concepts and then little implementations. We'll see, you know, real transformational implementations I think, yes, there will be regulation, but I think that that will just be kind of part of doing business. It will sort of stabilize and people will adjust to it. And we'll be saying, you know, why were we so worried about regulation? You know, lots of things that we do are regulated. Uh, and so, you know, just this tremendous creative potential will be unlocked. Um, I, I personally think that, you know, some of the problems that exist in, in kind of these, these markets around kind of you know, scaling, speed of transaction, you know, working out, you know, what's an efficient consensus mechanism? Are we destroying the planet with energy consent? You know, I think that we, we are going to make tons of progress in solving these things. I think some of the household names, you know, whether it's tokens or coins or, or blockchain implementations will be things we haven't even heard about yet. And, and I, I also think um, it will be, um, you know, a kind of blockchain ledger technology in combination with other technologies that's really going to be the, the revolutionary thing. It's combined with kind of sensor data, Internet of Things type um, capabilities, with kind of big data, you know, kind of computing capabilities. But, you know, I, th I think, you know, where we'll be two or three years from now is going to be tremendously exciting, and I think we'll be the better for it. I'm going to skip over you, Alex, and let you go last. I well, what's most exciting to me is that you have small issuers actually starting to create markets um, for themselves again, whereas over the past 20 years, you know, small and micro cap companies, you've seen so few uh, new offerings and new issuers out on the market. So I think that, uh, you know, it's going to be two years from now, it'll be generally accepted that these are securities. Reg A is going to be the uh, avenue of choice, Reg A plus offering and you're going to actually see small companies um, start to go public and create a market for their stock um, and reverse this trend that we've seen over the past 20 years of companies staying private longer. 
Um, and I think that's very exciting, and it's going to give um, investors, everyday Americans, the ability to, to actually get on on small companies at their early stages. Um, and you know, some are going to fail, some aren't going to make it, but at least there's going to be these opportunities for, um, and it's going to be done the right way with transparency, and I think it's very exciting. You know, can I, can I just uh, agree with that for a moment? Because uh, you know, I, I, I absolutely believe that, that that's that's a great vision, and you know, something that's really been missing, and this is why I think that the, the regulators will actually help this, is that you know, there's a concern that ordinary investors can't invest in these new companies and, and new ideas, and and that's why, as much as the SEC has been seeming to crack down on parts of it, they realize there's a tremendous opportunity, as as you said it so well, to Know, democratize access to these new ideas from small companies to, for, for these uh, entrepreneurs and innovators you know, to bypass traditional channels, to bypass the kind of venture capitalists who've sort of been choking, <coughs> choking them and kind of drip feeding them you know, investment. And, and so I, I really encourage strongly your vision. So um, I'm going to let Alex finish this up. And I, I just kind of like <coughs> want to note um, that we, at least most of us, um, lived through this kind of internet revolution of like a world that just never could imagine existed, right? And then like five years later you wake up and it exists, we can never imagine a world without that. I think we all feel that way about cell phone service in the subway, Alex. So with that said, <laughs> what are your final thoughts? Yes, thank you for that plug-in. Um, um, so I, I'm not worried about regulation. I'm, I'm, I think, uh, again, uh, again, give you an example, in Korea, uh, the finance minister came out and said, this is bad, we're going to shut it down. And the next day, the, another minister came out and said, no, 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 the government uh, doesn't mean that. And uh, then the finance minister came out and said, no, I, I'm going to shut it down. And, uh, you know, like people, the prices in Korea were going crazy. 200,000 people came and demonstrated, unorganized. Because I, I was in Korea, I said, who organized this demonstration? And they said, no one. This is like... People just showed up and they started screaming and the government said, okay, okay, we, you know, we understand, we're going we're gonna to let it keep going, right? So, so power to the people, right? And, and this, is, this is not, just like the commissioner said, right? This is, this is something that the next generation wants. And the reason they want it is because even they couldn't explain to you the financial system, they know that they're not going to be able to repay the $20 trillion that the U.S. government owns everybody around the world. So they want a different system. And, and, and that's really what they're struggling with. This is not a fight. When I'm telling you that Pac-Man is going after the dollar, Pac-Man is hungry. He's going to go and eat up. The dollar is, I don't know how many, 20, what was it, like hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of uh, uh, capitalization dollars, right? All the securities, all the debt, all the bonds, all of the uh, currency trading. That's what the aim is. Okay, that's, I, I want to make sure you guys don't have any second thoughts about it. Pac-Man, the, the crypto world is going to eat up the dollar. I'm predicting that now. It's not going to take two years. It might take 20 years, but that is what the competition for. Who's going to be the store of value? And, and so this is a, a, a fundamental shift in, in, in the evolution of, of humanity, right? This is not just a little change, right? And, and, and that's why it's so scary. It's not just scary to banks, it's scary to governments. So, so again, I think if you're asking me what's going to happen in the next two years, we need the Netscape moment. We need to, back to your point, right? We need some application. I think it's, again, it's issuing credit or paying interest to people. Uh, but it's something that's going to dramatically impact the next 100 million people and bring them into crypto. If you don't have that, if that doesn't happen, Prices will collapse, uh, coins will uh, disappear, scams will be everywhere because everybody's going to be trying to go to the exits at the same time. So, so I, I just, you know, I think we need a trusted wallet. We need something that we can really believe is doing what's in the best interest of each one of us. And, and, and that's the kind of like the Pandora box that allows all kind of other financial services or healthcare services or other things to proliferate because they all need to to come from a foundation that we trust. And that's what doesn't exist today, right? So, so that Netscape moment is going to be about a point of trust from which all this propagates. I definitely have to comment on this one because I think the, 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 the whole 
ecosystem has a lot to destroy. The store of value is not what a currency is about. The store of value is in goods, real goods, their services, and whatnot. Currencies are only a medium of transaction, and they need to focus on that. The amount of so there are not as many dollars in the hands of people. They're not paper and money. It's just a ledger. Dollar is a ledger. It's just right now measuring value, right? But it's really it's exactly what Bitcoin is. The no, no, Bitcoin no, is a ledger no. that measures value. It's no, exactly no, no. the definition no, of Bitcoin. No, it is measuring. Bitcoin no, I'm not. It's not true. It's right. not true. It's Explain true. to me what it's Bitcoin not is. Value at all. Okay. There's nothing valuable inherently. Let me go back to my uh, uh, prop here. Here, twenty trillion dollars. Twenty trillion dollars. Okay, because no one believes this piece of paper, it's worthless. But if all of us believe that this was twenty trillion dollars, it would be worth twenty trillion dollars. So, the the in exactly the same way, Bitcoin today is worth nine thousand dollars or eight thousand dollars, whatever the price so is. No, I think you just said it. It's a medium of exchange. It's not a medium of storage of value. It is, if it is not, no, I'm saying, you cannot get, buy I'm Bitcoin. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying Bitcoin never was and never will be a medium of exchange because Bitcoin is. Look, today, today there is half as many people accepting Bitcoin as five years ago physical locations that you can walk in and do a transaction with Bitcoin. So five years ago, there were twice as many people accepting Bitcoin. So how do you explain that? It's, it's actually losing its viability as a form of payment. Well, I, 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 no, but I think that, you know, That's just a fact. I'm technically, not that, it. technically that may be the case and the value is volatile. But if you walk to, you know, anybody and said, I will give you a Bitcoin and transfer it to your wallet in exchange for something, people would figure out a way to accept it because people understand that it has value. It may be cumbersome for merchants to accept it, but I think it's kind of... That's not my point. My point is, talk to a 20-year-old and ask him, why do you hold Bitcoin or Ether or, or uh, Litecoin? And the reason they'll give you is not because I want to buy something with it. The reason they'll give you is because I never want to walk into a bank. I never want to have anything to do with the bank. So, 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 the, so those are the, the, that is the problem, right? The problem well, that's is a different problem. That's the, the but that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I understand it's a show problem. Here, here's the good news. We're good. We get to have all this conversation. Not to be controversial <laughs> anymore. No, it's good to be controversial. We get to have this conversation 15 minutes. Let's thank the panel. And, uh, yeah. Good. Like I started this out like what's the most valuable currency in the world, right? And then I got them fighting at the end. Oh boy, this is the best. So they're gonna take a picture. Howard, you're next. Howard's gonna come up. I'm gonna pretend I did something. I have Instagram. Yeah. Do you have to check you? Yeah, yeah. No, no, come on here. Hey! The issue is, I mean, me and the issue is people are using it a lot. Oh, this? He's got to do it for his I know, but it's not. I mean, the reality is, I
device to enable many of the things that we've been talking about. So today we're going to focus on cryptocurrency, that application. However, as I think all of us can appreciate, there's a lot of applications on the blockchain where this would apply. So, parent company launches cryptocurrency data feeds. Uh, a lot of interest in cryptocurrencies now. We want to go after one of the big challenges in cryptocurrencies. Some of the realities of digital currency. The owners are liable for their security. By nature, there is no central figure that is responsible for the security. Also, access to accounts and currency require authentication. I also want to reinforce the point that any data that's stored on the internet is also subject to hacking. So some of the problems. The hot or digital wallets are vulnerable to attack. Two weeks ago that happened. $534 million. <coughs> Seeds, passcodes, passphrases, pins, private keys, they can all be lost, stolen, or destroyed. Through digital wallets, even the hardware wallets can be destroyed. Paper wallets can obviously be destroyed or lost. Restoring those wallets, ironically, requires you to keep passcodes, passphrases, and pins that can also be lost, stolen, or destroyed. Fifteen billion from hacking lost in Bitcoin. Hot wallets are on the internet, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Cold wallets require the passcodes and phrases, some of the challenges that exist. So what are some options today? The ledger, Tracer, Keep Key. These are what's called cold wallets, hardware wallets, that still require the passphrases. In fact, I think the ledger is 24 word randomly generated passphrase. Not something that you're going to remember very easily. We have the cold wallets. Those are actually, yes. So we've got the cold wallets, the hardware wallets. They require all of your password authentication. And we've got all the hard wallets that also require password authentication, but are web-based and are subject to hacking. So our solution patent pending solution that we are providing to this market space. We have the key to secure these digital transactions and you are actually that key. So this is a simple device that we have, it's a hardware device that is functional, that becomes a hardware wallet that is biometrically authenticated. Now, some of you may say, well, there's fingerprint readers all over the world. What is so special about this? It not only verifies that it's your fingerprint, but it verifies that the print is from a living person, that it is actually from you. Some of the first people that hacked iPhones, they hacked it with a picture. The first people that hacked your Samsung devices hacked it with glue, Elmer's glue. Okay? So, no image or copy of your fingerprint will work to authenticate through this device. Okay. Multi-factor authentication using the enhanced biometrics, where fingers from either hand, a sequence of fingers from either hand, can work. Each fingerprint is unique, and that be can become the passcode, passphrase, and in the example of restoration, that is your seed. So, if it is lost or destroyed, 
the restoration seed basically takes an encrypted kernel that has matched your fingerprint with your private key, in the case of cryptocurrency, to restore to a new piece of hardware. Okay? It is the most secure wallet, and it is the most frictionless wallet, because you don't have to manage passphrases, codes, pins, seeds, etc. Okay? So, I'm not going to read all of these, but this is the process that we use to both initialize this hardware wallet using encrypted data and then being able to back up that encrypted data, as well as the transaction process through to authorized transactions and the restoration process of how you can take the information that has been encrypted and put it onto a new device. We have functional and proven hardware reader with encryption. What we are looking to do now is connect that to the cryptocurrencies and blockchain with a user interface and a workflow that en enables this frictionless process. Howard is the founder. Uh, I have been on the advisory board. David Sharifi is our uh, intellectual property. We've got advisors on the financial side as well as on the fundraising side. Uh, Gene is actually here as well. So we are in the preliminary stages of, of investment and, um, and so far our development has been very positive. We're excited to get into the cryptocurrency market where we feel there's a strong value proposition. We also recognize that everything from healthcare that we've talked about today, wherever identity is a required authentication, we can play. We can add security, we can add a seamless process for all of those who hold data, who hold currency. Uh, we, we appreciate um, you listening. Thank you very much. For information, go to itbiometrics.com, sign up for our newsletter. Well, thank you everybody for coming out. We have uh, managed to stop the stock market from bleeding. No one here has been harmed. And uh, after this, there is a uh, private reception, so if you uh, get with uh, Sydney and the team, um, they will get you arranged uh, for that. But otherwise, we look forward to seeing everybody in LA, right? That's yeah. in the next yeah. step on the wall. We have a party in the next door. Yeah, he said. Okay, yeah, and we have a party next door. Next door. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is better now? <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, right next door. So, thank you. 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 Thank you.